Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Our webinar today is on maximizing your code review process for agile development. Um, and let's make some introductions. Um, so I am Patrick Londa. I'm a marketing manager here at SmartBear uh, for our product collaborator specifically. Um, and I'm joined here uh, today with Jonathan Fortunati. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Uh, and as far as Agile goes, um, we'll explain a little bit about our backgrounds. Um, so the last two organizations that I've been a part of, um, Agile has been a really big part of uh, how, how everything gets done. Um, the last company I was at, uh, was w primarily working on medical device uh, software um, and mobile apps. So a lot of the development process and the design process um, was based on the agile me methodology uh, where we were working in sprints. Uh, there was a lot of, um, a lot of scrums and retrospectives as, as part of our process as well. Um, and then John, what's, what's, what's your background as far as agile goes? Sure. So my background, I've been both on a development team as a dev team member and as a scrum master. So I spent a number of years um, working within an agile team, but then also working on the other side where I'm trying to figure out how to help teams be more agile and uh, spread a agile philosophy throughout an organization. Awesome. Um, so before we dive in, uh, we want to make sure that everyone's sort of aware of, you know, who SmartBear is, who, you know, the kind of work that we do um, and the kind of solutions that we offer. So uh, SmartBear, we're, we're a leader in software quality tools for teams. Um, so really, we have, we have a number of point solutions across the software development lifecycle. Um, and the goal of those solutions is to help teams work, uh, work faster and work better uh, to ultimately produce that higher quality software um, and shorten your, your time to market. Um, so a, f a f sort of layout of those solutions. We have everything from Collaborator, which we'll get into a little bit today. Um, for code and document review, we have test complete, uh, which is really great for automated UI functional testing. Cross browser testing lets you run tests on real devices uh, based off our, our lab down in Memphis. We've got alert site for monitoring um, for you know, web and API performance. We've got Swagger Hub, which is really great if you're uh, you know, looking to design and uh, document your APIs in a really collaborative way. Um, we also have SOAP UI Pro, really great for automated API functional testing. Um, and Service V lets you do really easy API mocking. Um, so really, you know, across the software development lifecycle, we've, we've, we've got a solution um, that is sort of tailor, tailor made to really improve the quality of your software um, and ultimately do that faster. Um, so, and also, you know, it, it, I think integrations are really key uh, especially as most of these devel most development teams are working with a handful of different tools, um, so it's really important to be able to to have your tools interact with each other. Um, so in, in integrations are a really big priority for us uh, at SmartBear. Um, so here's the agenda. Uh, we're gonna quickly you know review Agile um, for for anyone who might not know. There's you know probably some folks on here who are who are very familiar, so we're not gonna spend too too much time there. Um, but I think it sort of establishes a good baseline. And then uh, we're going to talk about setting expectations and roles. Um, we're going to talk about conducting iterative reviews. We're going to talk about uh, productive retrospectives and, you know, what some of the keys to that are. Um, and then we're going to walk through an agile review in uh, Collaborator and, and sort of show how our tool can enable teams to uh, really take their agile approach to their code reviews um, in a really meaningful way. And then at the end, uh, if anyone has questions, uh, you know, that you can feel free to put them in the chat box um, and then we, we can address them at the end. Um, but I do wanna start with a quick poll just to sort of see where everyone's at. Um, so this poll is just to get a baseline, um, asking, you know, how would you best categorize your team's development approach? You know, is it, is it agile? Is it agile? You know, where you have some elements of, of, of an agile approach, but maybe, maybe you're in an industry that, um, you know, can't go fully agile, or maybe you're, there's sort of uh, organizational uh, thrash in order to get there. Um, obviously, waterfall, sort of the classic um, model where things sort of tear down. Um, all right. So, uh, all right. I think we've gotten some good participation. So, uh, I'm going to close this out in just 
maybe 10 seconds. So if you haven't, haven't responded yet, uh, you know, now is the time. All right. So I'm gonna share the results. It looks like most people are, are agile, but a lot of folks are agile as well. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's fairly reasonable. I mean, it's, it, from my experience, uh, you know, it seems like a lot of teams like the, uh, sort of mentality of agile. Um, but practically, you know, there, there are maybe it's the nature of the business that you're working in or, or the industry that you're working in. Um, agile is also a very, very common approach. Um, and might, might have its own unique benefits depending on the team. Uh, so in February of 2001, um, a bunch of uh, software enthusiasts got together and, and published this Agile Manifesto. Um, and it's really gained no notoriety since then. I think it's been somewhat instrumental in sort of capturing a lot of what the Agile movement's about um, and sort of launching it in, in a sense. Um, I think the big the big things that people typically point to are are these four lines in the middle of you know individuals over interactions, um, or individuals and interactions over processes and tools, um, you know, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. Um, I think I think that last one's really critical, right? I mean, if if you want to work agile, you want to you know be really iterative and um, sort of move, move quickly, then I think responding to change is, is sort of at, at, at the heart of that mentality. Um, and then, the, yeah. Actually, just a note on these, and one thing they'll always say uh, if you're at an Agile seminar or something like that, is it's not that the stuff on the right is bad or that we want to ignore it. It's just that the stuff on the left is the stuff we want to value more. And I think that's important when working with teams to understand that, that sometimes you do have to have some documentation. You don't want to get rid of documentation. That would be bad. Um, and you also don't want to get rid of planning because that would also be bad. It's also, that's a very important practice. Um, but again, we want to value the stuff on the left. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, so, so there are also some sort of 12 key principles of agile software development, um, just sort of a extenuation of sort of that, that initial manifesto. Um, and yeah, I mean, the keys are, you know, early and continuous delivery of valuable software, um, you know, welcoming changing requirements, um, trying to have your have your output at either a couple of weeks or a couple of months, but you know frequently getting your software out there. Um, I think this one's interesting that you know business people and developers you know must work together. Um, I think often it's easy to sort of work within your own silo, um, but I think the sort of cross functional nature of agile um, is, is something that was long overdue. Um, and and yeah, trusting the people on your team to get the job done. I mean, I think, I think if you can build a culture of trust, you know, that, that can go a long way. Um, also face-to-face -face conversation. I think, I think that can get a little tricky now, nowadays as a lot of teams are, you know, really dispersed. Um, you know, you could have a team that's, you know, working in multiple countries or, or in multiple states at least. Um, so face-to-face -face conversation can be tricky, but I think, you know, nowadays there are tools like Slack and Gchat um, and Skype that, that make it a little bit easier to really um, include those face-to-face -face conversations, even if even if your development team is all across the world. Um, so, you know, working software is a primary measure of progress. Uh, you want to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Um, so, I think I think that's important. Um, I, I think when a lot of people try to go agile, um, maybe maybe there's a burnout in, in in the first in the first few sprints that they try because um, they're trying to pack everything into into one you know one sprint or they, they don't exactly know what their bandwidth is going to actually look like. Um, so I think maintaining a constant pace is, is really important. So you avoid that burnout. Um, and then technical ex excellence, good design. Um, I, th I, th I thought this was interesting, maximizing the amount of work not done. Um, so this, this is kind of the, the notion that, you know, uh, you want to, you want to go about things as, as simply as possible. So, um, so, you, you know, you're not doing a ton of work and then, looking back and saying, oh, well, we could have just done it that way. That would have, that would have saved us a lot of time. And I think clear requirements comes into that uh, phrase as well. Making sure that you know what exactly is my customer trying to do and then just doing that thing instead of letting yourself being like, oh, we could do this other cool thing too in parallel with that. No, let's just do that one thing, let that customer get their value. And then later we can plan to iterate on that and develop it further. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, I, I think building out features is, is, 
you know, really a big part of that. Um, so, so when you're when you're building out those features and you're and you're setting those requirements, make sure that you know every feature you're building is tied to you know, something that's a specific ask. Um, so you can you can really get to the get to the heart of the solution you're trying to build um, without without going too far off path. Um, and then you know the best arch architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Um, you know this is this can be kind of a difficult thing if you're working in a sort of very hi hierarchical um, or org structure. Um, but I think you know even even with with you know within your teams, if you're able to be collaborative and and um, you know communicate effectively, then I think you have a higher ability to become self-organizing. Uh, and really sort of take take some of the autonomy um, that might not be inherently given in a traditional org, org structure. Um, and then I think, you know, at, at regular intervals, the, the team reflects on how to become more effective. Um, I think for most teams, this this comes about as a sprint retrospective um, where you, know, you can sit down and uh, get to the heart of, you know, what's going well, what's not going well. Um, and we'll get into that in, in just, just a little bit. Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, putting agile methodology into practice for code reviews. Um, and there's just a few key topics that, that I think are, are good to discuss before, um, before we really sort of get, get into the, the nitty gritty on this kind of thing. Um, I think, I think one, one really big important thing is setting expectations, um, and setting roles. So, you know, making sure everyone on your team has, has a clear understanding of, of, you know, what their job is. Uh, what the timeline expectations on on certain tasks are, um, John. In, in in your experience, has has this been a big big deal uh, for the teams that you've been working on? Defining roles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the most successful teams that I've worked on have, at some point, typically when they first form as a team, have an exercise where they define expectations and roles. Because really, if you look at like a Scrum environment, you only have a few roles. You have the product owner. You have the dev team member whether your responsibilities, front end design, back end design, QA, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're just a dev team member. And then you have the scrum master. And if you take into cross functionality, being able to kind of play multiple roles, wear multiple hats within the team, it's very important to understand what are your roles and expectations from everybody else on the team. When conflict arises and conflict will arise within the team, that's actually a good thing if handled correctly knowing the expectations for those roles is it going to make is going to make it easier to navigate that conflict and resolve any issues you're having within your team and ultimately be more effective and have a more pleasant work day yeah absolutely and i think when it comes to to, to code reviews specifically um i think i think a lot of teams uh you know you, you you might be working in github or bitbucket where um where where your code review process might might stop after after the you know pull request workflow um, and I think that can be tricky because because in that in that scenario you you know you might only have two roles there of you know someone asking for feedback and someone giving feedback. Um, so so I think it can be a little tricky, uh, you know, sort of marrying the roles of sort of your your typical uh, source control management tool um, with the roles that you've established in in sort of your agile team. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've been had an experience before where as a scrum master, um, it's helpful for me to know why something like a story is being held up so I can, you know, do whatever I need to do to help push that story through. And uh, it's can be tough to get that visualization if you don't know if you can't easily see who is the person that's supposed to be performing the review, who is the person that's supposed to be looking at these things. And a lot of times if you ask the dev team, they're like, well, I don't know, or, you know, and they may not give you access to the tools just because of the way the organization uh, is structured in the, the time it takes or the process it takes to get access to some of those tools. So it can be hard to be in the dark about, you know, who's doing what, um, you know, uh, information radiators are very important. We'll talk about those later, but yeah. Um, so, you know, a few tactics to consider adopting. Um, I think, you know, as John mentioned, defining the expectations of each role, um, that participates in a code review. Um, so, you know, for, for, for our tool collaborator, we, you know, we, we have four, sort of specific roles that, that come out of the box um, where you have authors, you have moderators, you have reviewers, um, and you have uh, uh, observers. Um, and, you know, you can sort of tweak that to fit whatever kind of workflow you want. Um, but but I, think, I think it's important to make sure that everyone is aware of, you know, what, what's the expectation, you know, what's the expected timeline on, on, on how fast I should turn around this review. Um, I think that's, that's really important and something to definitely consider. Um, and I think rotating review roles is also really important. 
Um, so you can you know, share that information and also reduce your bus number. Um, for, for folks who might not be familiar, um, it's a little bit of a morbid analogy. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's sort of the idea that you know, if, if, if one of the members on your team you know, someday gets hit by a bus um, and is no longer able to you know, push your project forward, are, is there someone on your team who can pick up where they left off and have an understanding of what they were working on? Or was that person in such a silo and working completely, um, you know, oh, just let Jim tackle that. And then, if, you know, if, if anything bad happens to Jim, then your team is, is gonna sort of be left, um, left in, a, in a lurch trying to make up for, uh, for, for that knowledge gap. Um, so I think rotating review roles is a really good way to um, share across your team, you know, what, what, are, what are folks up to? Uh, and just make sure everyone's aware of roughly what what your team is doing. Um, and then lastly, I think adopting language uh, to help build an ownership culture. I think ownership's a pretty prevalent thing in Agile um, in the sense that, you know, once you break these projects down into these smaller tasks, um, you know, each task should have an owner or, or owners um, and, you know, you should have some accountability there. But I think if the more you can turn it into an ownership culture where people are, are, are proud to bring what they've been working on to the table um, and trusting of each other that, that we're all, you know, on one team, you know, sprint to sprint, trying to bring a, bring a project to, to fruition. Um, I think, I think that's really important. So, so thinking a, a little bit about how you're communicating with each other, making sure that the language that you're using um, is helping to build that, that overall culture. Um, and then, so let's, let's sort of walk through, I mean, this is a little simplistic, but um, running iterative reviews, right? I mean, this, this can work for code reviews, this can work for document reviews. Uh, this, this is a sort of code review example where, you know, you, you, you have an author who makes a few changes uh, to, to, to code files and wants them reviewed. He will then add participants to a review. You know, okay, I, I need feedback on this from, you know, uh, Sally and Jim, um, and then they'll look through, they'll make comments, um, they'll mark things that, you know, might, might need to change, um, you know, before we can finally approve those changes. The author will go back, look at that feedback, make some more changes. The reviewers will then evaluate those changes. Um, and then maybe, maybe something comes up when they're evaluating those changes and they bring in maybe a third party, you know, someone who, who they weren't sure would need to be in the review initially, but has some information that is going to be really helpful. Um, so that, that person might, might come into the process and say, you know, we're, we're changing how we, we do this. We're, we're now we're doing this. Um, and then it, it sort of has to cycle back through the author makes changes, uh, reviewers evaluate the changes. And then finally we get, we get, you know, a successful review. We can close that out. Um, and that, that review would be done, but you can, you can already sort of see, you know, a successful review process is very iterative. It's very much uh, in the spirit of agile, um, where you're, you're you're trying to bring in cross-functional folks. You're trying to, um, you know, share that information, get everyone's best feedback, um, and then ultimately, you know, move on to your next to your next iteration. Um, so I, I think a few tactics to consider adopting. Um, I would say try to configure notifications to really drive your process forward if possible. Um, a lot of the times, you know, you can create a, a document or, or code file, and then maybe you submit a pull request. Um, you know, you don't really have a lot of mechanisms in place if you're just using GitHub or Bitbucket to really uh, push that person to, to complete the review, uh, you know, get, get, get their feedback in, other than just kind of ma manually nagging folks, uh, which takes time out of your day. Um, it, it sort of wears down on, on that ownership culture because it, it turns folks inward on each other trying to say, well, where's that review? That's holding me up. Um, so if, if there's any way that you can add notifications to your process, I think that's, a, that's an easy way to uh, try to try to push this whole iteration faster. Um, also, I'd say creating checklists for common types of reviews. Um, so, you know, if you're seeing, okay, for this, maybe there's a section of your code that needs extra security scrutiny. Um, so making sure that everyone has that expectation, has that sort of 
you know, even if it's a mental checklist um, that, okay, I, I need to make sure I'm doing static analysis on this. I'm going to pass this over to a security tool and get a secondary analysis. Um, you know, just making sure that everyone's sort of aware of what the process is for different types of things. Can I throw a note on that? Absolutely. Um, a lot of times uh, when I was a Scrum Master, one of the outputs from a retrospective would be have a checklist for the review. Typically, we would sit in a retrospective. We'd say, "Why did this? Why did this bug exist? How did this happen? Did we do all these things when you're supposed to be doing the review?" And someone would kind of like lower their head and say, "I kind of just forgot to do that." Um, so that was an actual output from a lot of retrospectives I've had with different teams. So it's it's important to have checklists, whether it's for a review and you know other types of ceremonies too, and other parts of the dev process. But um, they can really help. Yeah, and, yeah, and sort of the other benefit is that if you do have that checklist, then you have a way of of knowing sort of how, how far a review is um, from being completed. And you yeah. know, if everything's checked off, you can say, "All right, this review is done." You can you can end the feedback that you're getting, um, so that you know you don't continually keep, keep getting feedback on code that that you already want to move forward with. Um, and then third, I would I would say ask yourself, um, is our workflow built to fit our tool, or is it built to fit our team? Um, so I think I think this is this is sort of the the notion that you want to be constantly evaluating, you know, are 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 we using the the workflow that uh, makes the most sense for for who we have on this project or who we have on this team, um, is it is it benefiting us and and how we want to interact most, um, or or are we sacrificing you know an ideal workflow because the tool that we're using, you know, only does it this way, um, so I think that's that's something to consider, um, in that. You know, there's there's a lot of tools on the marketplace that are pretty flexible, um, but a lot of them are only flexible in certain ways. So I think it's it's important to to always be evaluating your your workflow and and maybe as part of that sprint retrospective, think about you know is is our process working for us or or should we consider um, making some sort of change. Um, and then I think the last topic that we want to get into at sort of a high level is uh, sprint retrospectives. Um, so John, what's, what's been your experience, uh, with, with, with retrospectives? Typically, I mean, the basic retrospective is, uh, what worked, what didn't work takeaways, right? So you sit down, um, talk about the things that went well, that sprint, talk about the things that could have been better that sprint dive into the specific things that could have been better. I, you want, actually, you want to dive into both really. Um, but eventually you want to prioritize prioritize the things that you want to take away from the retrospective and say, let's focus next sprint on either improving something that didn't go well or taking something that did go well and figuring out how to make it better. Um, how, that's, how, how, how long did, did your retrospectives typically last? It depends on the sprint. If it would be like a one week sprint, I would probably get a retrospective between half an hour to an hour. If we're talking about a four week sprint, I'd probably schedule much longer. Um, what I find is that when people get into a retrospective, and I think this is going to be one of the takeaways in the next slide, is people tend to need some time to vent about the sprint. Maybe it's there was a management change, and they just have to say, they just have to talk about it. They just have to complain. Yeah. But, you know, not complain, but just talk about it. They have to vent. Giving them that time to vent is important. And the longer the sprint, the longer they need to vent because there's more stuff that happened over that time period. Um, but then afterwards, it's up to the Scrum Master, who's ever facilitating the event, to kind of bring the team in, corral them in, and have them start focusing on productive conversation using whatever kind of facilitation technique. Um, there's some great websites out there that have lots of different ways to run retrospectives. Um, but again, having those concrete takeaways is a very important thing. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there because I think you have some other points, and I'll talk about those points more. And sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I think... Um, having those takeaways is really important. I think I think one way to get to those takeaways is by having uh, you know key performance indicators yep. or, or, or or KPIs um, that you can regularly review as part of your retrospective process. Yep. Um, you know that doesn't mean that you need to review thirty different metrics and and try to um, see where where you live within that within that matrix. Um, you know if you if you have three things that you're looking at or four things that you're looking at um, that that are meaningful metrics to you. Um, that, that, that your team has decided, you know, this is important to us as, you know, the number of defects that we're finding, or maybe how much time we're spending on code reviews, um, or maybe, you know, just, you know, uh, how many tests are we running? You know, 
really you can you can set it up to however your team yeah and i mean i've seen kpis kpis are scary when you when you go to a team i mean especially as a scrum master if i were to go to a team and say we're going to have kpis on our performance they're going to say oh great you know <laughs> sarcastically they're not going to be excited about that but then when you explain what they really are and how valuable they can be and what they really can be i mean they can be as simple as a thumbs up or a thumbs down on how did the sprint go or a thumbs up on thumbs down on code quality leaving the sprint um, something we look for for trying to enforce a code review process is that code quality would get more thumbs up than thumbs down as time progresses. So KPIs don't have to be scary and they can be easy. And like Patrick said, keep them small. You don't want like a million KPIs because then it, you're not gonna be able to keep track of them. Your team's not gonna wanna keep track of them. Uh, it's just excess work. You want a few things that are important, again, because we only have a couple of goals coming out of the retrospective. We don't want a ton of different things to change. We just want to focus on either making one thing even better or taking something that wasn't so great and trying to make it a little bit more great. Yeah, for sure. And I think that kind of gets back to that agile, you know, key principle of making, of measuring, you know, the work not done. Um, so, so if you're able to really simplify your KPIs, it saves you a lot of time trying to wrangle a bunch of data together. Um, but then again, you know, you, you also do want some data, uh, you know, at least available if, if that's something that you want to, you want to include in, 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 in your retrospective process. Um, and then I think the last takeaway, you know, people probably already do this, but I, I think it's important to offer recognition to those individuals who really went above and beyond during the sprint. Um, I think this is, this is sort of, you know, this is applicable for any team. You want to make sure that, that you're giving opportunities to boost morale, that you're recognizing um, individuals who are, who are really working hard. Um, and you know, it doesn't have to just be, you know, uh, developer of the month or, or, or something like that. You know, you can, you can recognize everyone on, on the team if, if, if that is applicable. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, one thing I remember seeing, we, I was a team, I was a small team. They, they were a platform team. So we're talking some very senior developers, some very smart guys. And um, one of the guys who was in QA was he was a younger developer just out of college. And uh, again, he was in the QA role. Um, but the team was a very inclusive team. They're a very cross-functional team. So they started giving him kind of dev work. And I remember one sprint, he actually developed a feature that was a pretty important feature to the process that they were trying to develop. And it was a great celebration in the sprint. And like his confidence was through the roof after that. He was willing to take stuff and it really, you could really see in uh, subsequent sprints, his ability to perform just by that recognition. It was a little thing like, great job, Nate. Um, I really went a long way. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's kind of surprising. Um, yeah, that just that little bit of praise. Uh, if if you know, if you include that in your retrospectives, um, you know, you, you can you can add a lot of momentum going into your next sprint. Um, so you know, just sort of in summary, you know, if 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 you're if if you can use your code reviews to drive your agile approach, that means you know, the faster you can cycle through those reviews, the shorter your time to market, the more defects you can identify early, you spend less time in rework. Um, if you're able to improve that cross-function communication, um, that's, that benefits skills across teams. Um, and then reviews are easy documentation events if, if, if you set them up right. Um, that allow you to show your work without manually spending time trying to document, you know, oh, I talked with uh, Mark about this and uh, this was my feedback. Um, so if, if, if you're able to configure reviews in an in a easily sort of automated, documented way, um, that can serve as a really valuable documentation event that can uh, sort of alleviate some of your manual work, especially if you're in like a highly regulated industry, for example. Um, so now, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get into how Collaborator enables agile code and document reviews. Um, we're going to show Collaborator a little bit. Um, I know it's at the top of the hour. Um, so if anyone has to drop off, uh, you know, we're, we, we do offer demos, um, but we'll, we'll dive in. Um, for, for anyone who's not familiar with Collaborator, uh, Collaborator is the only enterprise grade uh, peer code and document review tool. So it's, it's sort of two in one. Um, it's built to standardize the peer review workflow that works best for you, uh, reduce software defects early, ease compliance burdens uh, with, with documentation, um, and ultimately shorten your development time to market. Um, so John, do you wanna show, show Collaborator a little bit? Sure. How much time do I have to do this? Uh, as much as you want. As much as I want. All right. Oh, yeah. You guys can be with me all day. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not that long. <laughs> all uh, right. Let me figure out how to share the screen. All right. I'm, uh, there we go. Turn it over to you. Stop two. 
So I guess just a note on code review in general, a lot of times when I'm working or when I was working with teams um, and we wanted to institute a code review process, look, typical scenario, right? We have a new team that's formed. You have a senior guy and then maybe three junior guys and maybe like one person in the middle and the senior guy says, all right, let's do code reviews. And everybody else says, oh, that's going to take a lot of time. We, we don't want to do that. Uh, a lot of people are afraid of the burden that comes with code review, like it's going to uh, be a constant expensive burden. But to me, it's a lot like paying a larger down payment on a house up front, right? You pay more up front and then your payments later throughout the term of the mortgage are less. And just like code review, yes, there will be some investment up front in having to figure out the process. But once you figure it out, it's going to really speed up your team because you're doing that cross functionality like Patrick mentioned. Uh, you're sharing knowledge throughout the team. People can work on more parts of the code base and your code quality is going to increase, which means you have less defects, uh, de defects to fix uh, as, they, as time goes on, which means less interrupters into your sprint, uh, less other teams coming to you and saying, hey, this, this thing broke, my API didn't work or something like that. Um, but hopefully everybody can see my screen. We're looking at a review in progress and we're just gonna kind of go through some of the things in Collaborator uh, that help help an agile process. I'm just going to quickly explain what we're looking at because I'm sure most people are seeing this for the first time and I don't want anyone to get lost. Um, so we're, what we're looking at is the web interface to Collaborator. Right now I'm on my home screen. I can see all my reviews that have been assigned to me or that I have created. And the review I was just in was a code review in progress. Like I said, up here, we have the status of the review. We can see it's in the rework phase. This means that the author is probably taking back some of the, taking some of the feedback from the reviewers, uploading a new version of the code, that kind of thing. Um, and we can see we have a bunch of information on here, some fields that were filled out, a checklist in the middle of the screen, participants that need to be added, some links to other tools like GitHub. And if this review was created via pull request, a link to the JIRA item that this review is associated with, defects that were found in the review, and down at the bottom, uh, materials. You know, everything that's been added to this review and all the conversations that are going around. Um, so so let's, go, let's go up to the checklist. Um, so so are, these, are these sort of out of the box uh, items or? Nope, the checklist is a custom checklist. So one nice thing about collaborators, it has this concept of templates. So a lot of times, it'll, a team will say, I want to look for these things in my code review, or maybe they come out of a retrospective and they say, it's important for us to grab this information during our code review. So for next uh, retrospective, we can measure some of those KPIs, right? So templates are going to let you have custom fields, which will let your dev team members put in data into the code review and capture that data. And it's also going to let you build out checklists. The checklists again, are going to help you keep track of all the things you should be looking for in your review. Um, and have a more complete, ensure completeness of your review. Um, in addition to that, one thing you can't see that these templates are going to modify is the roles and participants on the review. So we talked about the importance of roles mm -hmm. and how it's important to define expectations and define what everyone will be uh, contributing to the process. The roles which are associated with the template will let you visualize that within Collaborator. So I can assign some people as the author and say these are the people responsible for making the changes to the code that the reviewers find in the review. I can assign some people as required reviewers. These are the people who are required to leave feedback. These are the people who are required to approve or deny the review. And then I can leave people as observers. These are the people who aren't required to perform a review, but they can if they want to. That's really key when it comes to cross-functionality. Now we can add, let's say, uh, the person who made the code change, we'll add them as the author. We'll add someone else on the team as the reviewer. But the other three people on the team, Let's add them as observers. They can go through, they can see what's going on, they can learn about the code, but they don't have to perform anything on the review. And again, that's gonna be really helpful to sharing knowledge throughout the team. And oh, yeah, and I think it's especially important uh, as, you know, as far as developer onboarding goes, um, you know, code reviews are a really great, great way to sort of uh, showcase how your team works, um, you know, what styles are, are you trying to standardize around, um, you know, what's, what's the right sort of, uh, pro, uh, you know, communication and feedback. Um, and also just, you know, you, you can learn about the code base through these code reviews. So if, if you have someone new join the team, you can easily add them as an observer to, to some of these reviews. Yep. 
Um, one great example that I have from real life, one of my friends is a developer at another company in Boston. And his team, uh, his company has a, a few teams that had some experts at JavaScript, right? And some other teams who were working on different types of development projects and they just didn't have that experience. So what the JavaScript groups did was create a JavaScript guild. And that guild is uh, some of the better, more experienced JavaScript developers all in one group. And what they do is they assign someone from that group to all code reviews that involve JavaScript. That way, the teams who don't have that experience have someone there who can poke around and say, hey, you maybe want to do this this way, change how you do this. Uh, next time, think about these things. Helping share that knowledge, not only within the team, but now across the organization. Um, so it's been really key to helping them grow their ability to uh, have teams work on different types of projects. So, and that's another thing that maybe people don't talk about as much in Agile, but not only having your team members be able to work on different parts of the code base within your team, but having teams be able to work on different parts of the product if you're working on a large project where there may be 10, 15 diff different teams. Yeah, and I think that's, that's one really great feature about Collaborator um, is, that, is that we do offer those review groups um, so you can create a group and, and say, you know, this is going to be our, um, our security group or, or, you know, our JavaScript group, um, or maybe, you know, th this is everyone who's, who's just joined the team. Um, and then when you assign out these reviews, um, you know, depending on what, what rules you want to establish, you know, as long as one person raises their hand and says, all right, yeah, I, I, I have the bandwidth to go, to go do that. Um, then everyone else stops getting a notification. You filled, you filled that uh, sort of requirement of having someone from that team or from that group uh, can be a part of that review. Um, so, so it really helps out if, you know, if you're on the team and you're like, well, I'm not sure if Joe has time to go review this. You know, if Joe's a part of a group, you can assign it to the group um, and make sure that at least someone raises their hand and says, yeah, I, I can actually go do that. Yep. And another cool thing is Joe can actually set up subscriptions for certain types of files. So you can say for every JavaScript file that shows up on a review, add me to that review. And if I think it's something I need to look at, I'll look at it. Or a group could do the same thing and say every time a certain file is used or a certain template is used or a certain user creates a review, add that group. So you can make it easy to pull these people on and make sure you have the right people on the review. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing I do want to point out, unless Patrick, do you have anything else on participants checklists or templates? Uh, no. One thing I do want to point out, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, is the importance of information radiators. Uh, again, as a Scrum Master, sometimes it's hard to figure out where the roadblock is, right? Your job's hard, part of your job is to remove roadblocks, and you're trying to figure out where the roadblock is, who's working on what, wh where, where are people getting stuck? What makes that easy is information radiators, and that's the concept of something visual that makes it clear and plain about what's going on. And that's one thing that I personally like about Collaborator is you have these information radiators, something as simple as a defect on line 136. We can see that that's a defect there because of the little red ladybug. And I can see that JF has been participating in that conversation around the defect. Again, making it easy for people to come through and see what's going on with this review. Likewise with participants, I can go up here and I can see, all right, these are the two people working on this review. I can even go over here and you can't see it because this review isn't started. Uh, but if this review was started or all these participants were added rather, um, I would be able to poke these people and send them emails and say, Hey, Colin, you're supposed to be performing this review. You know, you're not, you're not performing, not pulling your weight over here. So these information radiators are going to make it easy for the dev team to quickly look at the status of the review and move on, move away from it, not make it a big deal. And, right. and, and a team could also set up uh, sort of automated notifications, right? Yep, absolutely. So if, if someone hasn't responded in a day, they could get another, another ping. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. Or if the review is approaching the deadline, if you set up a deadline, then you can have uh, email notifications go out. Um, so it makes it again, really easy to visualize and pull people into the review and visualize what, what the status of the review is and who's doing what and what their role is, especially on like a larger review for like a major change, maybe like a feature review versus just like a quick review from a GitHub pull request. Sure. Can, can, can we take a look at the, uh, the, the, the diff viewer? Sure. Um, which is probably where I think most developers would end up spending their time. Yeah, let me pull this open. So what we're looking at is the diff viewer and collaborator. And a pretty standard diff viewer, nothing too special here in terms of what it's doing. It's just showing the difference between two different versions of the same file. 
we can see things that have been added in green, things that, that have been removed in red, things that have been changed in yellow with the specific change being bolded. And then on the far left over here, we have all our conversations. And these conversations, they're tied to the individual lines where those conversations are taking place. And it's one important thing to note is that these conversations persist throughout different versions of the same file. So if I leave a, co uh, a comment on version one of the file and then I upload 10 versions, that comment's still gonna be there and it's gonna move around with that line number as that line number moves. So it's gonna make it easy to have that traceability and to understand where that conversation um, or why those changes are being made throughout the life of the code review. Yeah, and something that, that sort of separates this from, from maybe, a, maybe a pull request or, or um, sort of SCM style uh, code review is that, you know, so line 126, you know, we've, we've marked for that line a specific defect. Um, so you're able to, you know, make, you know, clearly differentiate between just comments, you know, you want to give your feedback, but, you know, nothing's maybe wrong with that section. You just want to give your feedback versus, okay, this is something we absolutely need to change. Right. Um, and, it, and it doesn't need to be a bug necessarily. I mean, it could be a typo. Mm -hmm. um, style change. Style change. Comment, need a comment. Um, and, and when you add those defects, you can you can change the severity. Um, so you're able to you know, get 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 some good reporting on. Okay, we had this many defects of this type severity, um, and you can also have sort of categories of, of those defects. Um, so you know you can see in this one it's it's a, an algorithm defect, um, severity major. Um, so it just allows you to sort of get a little bit more data on you know okay, we're doing all these reviews, you know, how many times are we coming up against something that absolutely needs to change? Yep. And, uh, you know, are, are we remedying that? How long is it taking to fix those defects? Um, I think that's really important as far as uh, the role that that, that 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 can play in the in, in, in your sprint retrospectives. Exactly. And the nice thing about those fields, severity and type, is those are custom fields. There's nothing special about those fields. You can add new custom fields for defects. So if you want to grab more information, about your defects or change the information. Severity and type are included uh, pre-built in, you know, but you can change those. And that will help you, like Patrick said, get more information for your retrospectives um, or even the other way around. Let's say you have a retrospective and one of the outputs of that retrospective is, you know what, we need better comments. Our comments need to fit this format because we're adding functions and people a year from now are gonna say, why the heck did we add that? you can mark those as defects and require that change saying we're not going to allow this review to move to production unless we have that or we're not going to let the code merge rather unless we have those changes in there one of the nice things about collaborator especially if it's integrated with something like github or bitbucket or gitlab is that you can make collaborator a check for the for the merge request which will prevent the merge if the collaborator review isn't completed so by the nature of adding these defects you know blocking the collaborator review which is then blocking the merge, which means you're required to make these changes of essentially gating your check-in. Yeah, so, so, so a lot of teams use Collaborator as sort of a quality gate. Um, so that they're able to go in, uh, identify defects early, uh, make sure that they've addressed everything. And then um, you, know, you, 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 you can easily configure it so that when you close out a Collaborator review, it automatically will merge that pull request on the other end. Um, can we take a quick look at, at maybe the, def uh, the, the details. details report? Yeah. So I think, I think this is also a really helpful thing if you're, if you're trying to go after, you know, retrospectives, <clears throat> what went well, what didn't go well. So before we get to the two important things that we want to point out, I'll just explain what we're looking at again. Review details report. This is a in-depth report on just one review. Now we have other reports that we can run too. So you can see aggregate data on multiple reviews or a bunch of different defects based on whatever filter you want to use. And this report's gonna include things that we'll expect to see, like title of the review, how many defects did we find, who created it, what time did it start, what time did it stop, checklist options, participants, all that stuff. But what's important over here, especially from a retrospective point of view, is inspection rates and defect density. So both of these are gonna help us get information, inspection rates in the units of line of code per hour and defect density in the units of defects per thousand lines of code. They're going to help us get information about the quality of our code reviews um, and the quality of our process around finding defects during the development phase of, of our um, cycle. 
So for example, inspection rate. If I want to understand how thorough we're performing a code review, I could use that to say, you know what, if my inspection rate's 10,000 lines of code per hour, I probably can't read 10,000 lines of anything in an hour. So that's probably a good indication that people aren't spending a lot of time actually reading the code. Likewise, if it's about 200 lines of code per hour or less, that's probably a good indicator that people are actually taking time to go through and actually understand what's being written there. For defect density, if I wanted to learn about uh, how, how impactful my code review process is in general to finding defects, we could look at defect density to see how many defects we're finding per thousand lines of code. As we get better at performing code reviews, we'd expect that defect density to actually go up, which is a good thing. It means we're finding more defects that were there in the first place that we weren't finding before. So again, both of these can be really useful KPIs that you don't even have to, there's no work to great making these KPIs. They're already there for you that you can pull into a retrospective and use to learn more about your code review process if the code review process is something that you're looking at improving um, through your retrospectives. Yeah, so th this, this really just gives you all the, all the information. And then from this, you can boil it down and say, okay, you know, what are the things I care about? What am I gonna be able to check on a regular basis? Um, and then I, I think the other thing that separates Collaborator from some other tools is that we also have document review capabilities. Um, so you know, part part of part of that agile uh, key principle uh, section was that we should be welcoming to changing requirements. Um, and when you always have requirements that are changing, maybe it's sprint to sprint or you know, over over the course of multiple projects, um, being able to see you know what what actually changed from from one version to the next is 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 really helpful. Um, without having to sort of manually go in and try to you know, squint and see, okay, well, th this line's here, this line's not here. Um, so Collaborator makes it really easy to conduct those uh, document reviews and, and uh, sort of easily overlay documents so you know, okay, this was added, this was taken away. Um, and just, just like you can make defects, um, you know, all of that instead of tying it directly to lines, and here it's tied to uh, pinpoints. Um, so that, that's why it works for any Word document, Excel, Excel file, um, PDF, PNG. Um, yep. And I think next week we're going to be releasing Collaborator 11.3, exactly. um, where we're going to be adding support for uh, na native, native support for uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, as well as Microsoft Visio. Mm -hmm. um, so really, you know, all, all these design documents or requirements or user stories that are, are part of your process already, but you, you, maybe you're doing it through Excel or SharePoint, or maybe you're managing it through email. Um, you know, the same workflows that allow you to push your code reviews forward can also allow you to push your document reviews forward, um, all sort of within this one tool. So you can get everyone, everyone onboarded, get everyone uh, using templates that, that makes sense for, for how your team wants to interact. Um, and it just makes it a little bit easier to manage that review process. Yep. Um, so if anyone has any, any, any questions, uh, feel free to enter them into the chat box, um, you know, on agile, um, practices or, or our, our tool collaborator specifically, um, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to answer any, any questions that you guys might have. We'll give a little bit of time if anyone's, if anyone, anyone's typing in. All right. So the question is details report, uh, how about com comment density in addition to defect density? Uh, many comment threads turn into fixes or changes that never get tagged as defects. So defect uh, stats are then misleading. So we have an overall summary of how many defect, uh, sorry, how many comments were made in the review. We don't have a metric like defect density like we do, I'm sorry, we don't have a metric like for comment density like we do for defect density. So you could compare the two, um, but we do have you can see the total number of comments that are made. Um, and you can always transform a comment into a defect later. So if you were to leave a comment and say, hey, should this be this value? And then someone says, oh, you know what? That is that value, let me change that. And they change it, but it was never logged as a defect. That author could go back in afterwards and then just transform that into a defect and then have that traceability um, going forward. Great. Um, so I'm not seeing any, any other questions come in through right now. Um, but if you have any other questions, feel free uh, to shoot either John or I an email. Um, we'll be following up 
with everyone just to see if anyone has questions. And we're also going to be sharing out a recording of this webinar. Um, so if anyone wants to share it uh, with, with other members of their team, or maybe just rewind and, and look at something again, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be sharing that out uh, shortly. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, and if you uh, are interested in Collaborator at all, we do offer demos. Uh, and, we, and we also have a free trial on, on, on smartbear.com uh, on the Collaborator section. So you know, feel, feel free to start a trial um, and you, know, you can sort of see how this would work for your team. Um, but again, thank you everyone for joining and uh, have a great day.